Thank you. I'm not sure. Am I okay? I'm okay. It's nice to know that the technology works because most of the time it doesn't. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about what computer science is and how it's helping make technology work and why you might be interested in looking at it as a subject. So um, first up, let's get rid of this comment form. See, computers are really annoying. This is why computer science exists. So I am from County Durham, so that makes me really northern in comparison to you lot. I studied an undergrad degree in biomedical sciences because I really liked chemistry at school, which was a bit weird, but that's what, I, that's what I enjoyed. So I went to university and studied something called pharmacology, which is understanding how drugs interact with the human body. And it was a really cool subject to study. It was really good, but I actually wasn't very good in the lab. And without being good in the lab, you can't really get ahead in that field. So at the same time, I started programming. Um, I had some friends who were doing a computer science degree and I used to go to their lectures and I found that their lectures were easier to understand than mine were. So I thought, hmm, maybe I'm in the wrong field. So I moved into computer science because it seemed a lot more creative and a lot more exciting than the biology that I was learning. So. Um, I worked for a little while as a software engineer for Hewlett Packard, you know, the people who make printers and stuff. And then off the back of that, I did a master's and a PhD, which means I, I did, had to do a lot of research and worked a lot of very long nights. And now I can call myself doctor. And this was in artificial intelligence, which is um, something that I really am pa very passionate about. Since 2008, I've been a lecturer in computer science and uh, I also play soprano corner in Ilkeston Brass Band and my other hobbies include being a stand-up comedian which comes in useful being a lecturer. So, but what I want to talk to you about today is one of the big problems that we have when our undergraduates come to us in their first year is that they expect degrees in computer science to be like their ICT classes. So, Hands up, how many of you have ICT classes as part of your curriculum? Yeah? That's, that's quite a lot of you. How many of you have classes in programming? Yeah. You see, so for us, your life begins when, you, when you're 18, and that's the first time most people will actually ever study anything to do with computer science. So we have a bit of a problem that people think that ICT and computer science are the same thing. So I'm just going to spend a little while telling you why that they're not the same and why computer science is a really exciting thing to study. So there's no one single definition. It's not like physics. Computer science hasn't been around for very long because computers haven't been around for very long. But the way I see it, it's understanding how computers work and how they can be made better, faster and cheaper and more accessible as well. What I really like about computer science is it gives you the power to tell a machine exactly what to do. And it's very rewarding when you realise that something that you've created is behaving how you want it to. It's also about understanding how to perform computation or how to uh, understand how you could take a bit of information and process it to get some knowledge. So it's all these things combined together. The cool thing about it is computers are into everything now, like practically everything. Everything from kitchen assistance through to booking your holiday online, through to all of the transaction software that banks use. So no matter what you're interested in, there's some form of application for computer science there. So it's really nice that you can move and shift disciplines as your interests change as you get older. But it's a bit tricky to pin it down to a single statement, but if I had to, I would call it the study of computation. So transforming information from one form into another. And it's everywhere now. 
not so much so 10 years ago, but certainly now, computer science is happening in your pocket as we speak. It's used for making programs and developing um, things like computer games or applications on the internet, social media frameworks like um, um, Facebook and Twitter. Understanding how you process some data from one value to another so that we can help scientists figure out what the chemical composition of Mars is or we can help doctors figure out how long someone might live if they're unfortunate enough to be diagnosed with cancer. It's also used in air traffic control systems and aeroplanes as well. Lots and lots of computer systems on board aeroplanes which have to be reliable. But now we're also seeing computers come into really new areas such as directly affecting the type of entertainment systems that we have. This includes the switch from uh, stop frame to 3D animation in feature films, the use of computer control and computer generated graphics in theme park attractions of which there are numerous. It's relied on really, really heavily in music production. Most of what you hear in the charts today wouldn't sound anything like it without the patterns of behaviour underpinning the system which is then used to create the music that we listen to. And of course, it's starting to shape the way in which we consume the old sort of media, the radio and television, the way in which we approach it, the way in which we try and integrate it into our lives is different now that we have all of these online media services. So it's shaping the way that we interact with this type of technology. And of course, the internet is coded by some developers who probably have a background in computer science. The thing that's important to stress is that these kind of things and this way of thinking about the world and these applications are not really the same as the stuff you get taught in your IT lessons, which is your biggest sort of, uh, organised exposure to computing. It's not the same as information technology, for example, using Word, Excel, or doing stuff with Access. For, to make an analogy so you understand the differences, it's really different actually using an iPhone to writing your own programs for it. So ICT is all about teaching you how to use the technology. Computer science tells you how to make the technology and how to make the systems work for you. And this is a really exciting and creative process. So you learn to interact with computers and their networks through learning interfaces called programming languages which is a bunch of special words that you can use to tell a computer what to do. Um, other ways of interacting with computers including interfaces. And interface design is a really big area within computer science. So the way I see it, it's a bit like you've got to know a bit of maths because you've usually got to know where stuff's going to be or you're processing some values. You've got to be a little bit good at modern languages because you've got to learn these um, syntactic, um, syntactic keywords. But it's actually a lot of fun because you get to create something from nothing and then deliver it to people. And that's a really satisfying process. <coughs> I suspect you're not convinced at this point by my sales pitch because you've probably got this image in your head of what computer scientists look like. And this was indeed very true in 1979. I'd really like to think that standing here today, I don't really resemble well, certainly any of the men on that picture, let alone the women. So this is the stereotype of what people think of scientists and computer scientists. Or like perhaps the guys off the Big Bang Theory, right? A bunch of nerdy people who can't interact with like society in general and just speak nerd all the time. Yes, there are people like this who still exist in these departments. And they're all very lovely, so don't ever bully geeks. But it's worth pointing out that every single person on this picture, taken in 1979, is now a multimillionaire, if not a multi-billionaire. These are the people who invented the Windows operating system, and despite their geeky exterior, I'm sure nobody cares what they're wearing when they're sat inside their Ferraris. So, we are trying to shake off this image as computer scientists, saying we're not all a bunch of nerds who sit at home and don't do 
anything and don't interact with the real world. And I'm here today to present you some of the research that we do at Nottingham, which helps us dispel this horrible stereotype that we all look like that. Oh, incidentally, does anybody know who the person is on the bottom left-hand corner? Yeah, Bill Gates, yes, very well done. So you know how much money he has, and look, he looks like a nerd, but nerds can be very successful, especially female nerds. So let's think of some really familiar examples of why computer science is awesome. Just look at the computers that you have currently in your pocket. Well, you might think, I've not really got a computer in my pocket, but you kind of do. The smartphone that I've got has got a better specification than the computer I did all of my uh, university work on, easily, hands down. And smartphones are really accessible, really high-powered devices which can do a lot, and they're, they're just living in your pocket. Also, think about things like iPods and MP3 players. They are small, embedded computers which perform a single task, but do it very well. And now think about the devices in your house, which are all based around um, computer science being everywhere. So, for example, I've got um, on-demand on TV, so I can watch various programs whenever I like them. And also internet TV, so I can download loads of shows from the US. Um, obviously when they're within copyright and my washing machine is full of a computer which is doing this computation called fuzzy logic so it decides based on how heavy and how dirty it thinks my washing is as to how long the spin cycle should go on for so it's really clever so these things that people work on in computer science are actually starting to become things that are in our handbags in our homes in our works and in our schools Devices are getting, as you can see, much, much smaller. And this is a trend that is set to continue for quite a while as our, the way we interact with these devices um, gets better. So this is the evolution of the iPod Nano. Um, at the top on the left, that was the original model, quite bulky and um, a dial-based interface. The next generation incorporated video, so they had to resize it again, but again it got smaller. And now we have the, the iPod Nano that we have at the minute, which is tiny, fits inside, not even in your pocket. It fits inside a pocket, inside your pocket. You know, the little pocket for money in your jeans, it fits in there. So it's quite amazing the fact that devices are getting smaller. Because they're getting smaller, because they're using less power, we can start to embed these devices in all sorts of places, including cars, fridges, hotel rooms, and also in healthcare as well. So not only are the devices getting smaller, but they're getting much, much more powerful. So this is a PDP-11. Um, this photograph was taken in 1971, and I had a mobile phone about six years ago, which had more power than this computer did, and this took up two rooms. And this is also a trend which is, seems to not really be stopping at the minute. So we can start to run really, really powerful applications that can do really loads of hard computation, dead quickly, with devices that are getting increasingly smaller. Not only can we make these devices really small, but we can make them what is called location aware, so that we know from GPS satellites where something is. And also, these devices can start to talk to each other. So we end up with a very different type of computer made up of a network of all sorts of different devices. So what does this mean? This means that the computers of the future, sounds really kind of sci-fi and a bit lame to be honest, but the computers that are gonna be around us in the next 10 to 15 years are not gonna look like a desktop anymore. They're gonna be lots of little distributed gadgets that you keep about your person, things that are built into work surfaces, terminals that are built into the side of wall panels. So computing is gonna surround us. So what we need to do is the next generation of computer scientists is to really figure out how we can design and how we can deploy for this type of technology. So one of the things I'm looking at is the future design of roller coasters. And this ties in computing equipment with, um, with entertainment. 
So I really like riding roller coasters. It's something that I like to do whenever I've got a spare weekend. I only live about 40 miles from Alton Towers, so I've got a season pass. I just jump in the car and go and ride some roller coasters. It relieves a lot of stress. And this is my favourite roller coaster. This is from Thorpe Park in, um, near Windsor. And this is an accelerator roller coaster. And this is probably one of the more high-tech roller coasters that we have here in the UK. And this is because it's an accelerator style of roller coaster. Most classical roller coasters have a lift hill, something that goes <coughs> and you sit in there waiting and you go up this massive hill and then it drops you. This one's a bit different, it has a slingshot mechanism. So the carriage is attached to some form of malleable um, material, a spring is loaded and ping, the cart's released and you shoot from 0 to 60 in 2.7 seconds. Then ascend vertically 200 feet in the air and then drop again. So this is kind of the limit of what's achievable through standard engineering. So what we're interested in is how can the addition of, of the latest technology in computer science make these kind of experiences even more extreme. So we've set up a virtual um, organisation called Thrill Laboratory where we stuck about 100 people or so over a number of sessions on a number of different roller coasters at Alton Towers. And what we did while we put people on these roller coasters, we measured um, their physiology. So that's their, their biological signals, the so stuff that's happening in their body. So we had um, a head mounted camera, which captured um, a first person video. So we could see the facial expressions of the people. We had a microphone for audio capture. So we could uh, hear what they were saying. We have a wireless biosensor module which allows us to get information such as heart rate, skin temperature, respiration rate and sweatiness. And all of this information was beamed via Bluetooth to a Sony VAIO portable computer which was strapped to the participant's leg. And these were all, all the equipment was held in soft leg mountings and of course for safety reasons they had to wear a helmet. So we set all of this equipment up and we looked at how people were physiologically and emotionally reacting to this experience. And my part in this was to write the computer software that decided what type of emotions the person was experiencing. So this is done through a really um, interesting piece of equipment, which is called a Nexus 10. It's a physiological monitoring kit used in hospitals for patients with mental health issues to monitor their emotional state at any one particular time. But we've taken this equipment and adapted it for our purpose for monitoring people's uh, emotions in a theme park. So what we found was normally people appeared to be scared at this point in the ride because they're about to drop into a massive hole at about 50, 60 miles an hour. So I've got a quick video of somebody um, who is actually on it. Just bear with me a second. So this is just a short clip. I hope there's some sound. <coughs>
I better turn it off before she starts swearing because she really loved it. So from all of this data, so this is the heart rate data that's been flitting around um, the bottom of the screen. And the graph that's superimposed on the top was how sweaty her palms were. And the interesting thing about this event was not only were we collecting this data, but we were beaming these images live to a crowd standing outside. So the friends and family of the participant could see uh, their video, uh, hear what they were saying, and also um, observe what their body was doing at the same time, which we felt really changed the experience from um, a single person um, experiencing this event to a collaborative experience. So just by adding some computer science, we totally transformed the dynamic of this person's day out at the theme park. <coughs> So why were we doing this, really? I mean, it was really good fun to go and work at Alton Towers, and if you ever get the chance, just do it. Um, the reason we were looking into it is because we wanted to make adaptive rides. We really think that this kind of thing is the entertainment of the future. So to build a ride or an experience which adapts itself to uh, the user's taste, specifically. So what we'd like to do is monitor how your body feels about a particular experience and then adapt that experience to maximise uh, the thrill or the pleasure of that experience. And I want to, um, well, what, what it is that I do is write and develop systems which control these rides, process the data, and can conduct the experiments to prove that they're not only useful, but also safe as well. And it also means that I got to ride a lot of roller coasters, which was kind of cool to get paid to do that. So we couldn't go to Alton Towers all the time, so we built a test bed in the lab. And what um, some of my colleagues built was something called a bronchomatic, which is an adaptive booking bronco. So the more air you, uh, you breathe in, the faster it goes. So you've got to hold on and kind of hold your breath and control the ride with your breath. Um, we've since built two more installations um, based on this technology. Um, including a swing which is controlled by your breathing so if you breathe in the swing goes back and if you breathe out the swing goes forward. Um, the interesting part about that experiment is um, my colleagues reversed that so a spectator was breathing so your swing was moving with someone else's breathing so they could just hold their breath and keep you suspended in the air. So it's really interesting how we can take this technology and put it into a different context because this technology was developed to help out people with mental health problems. We've also looked at using this technology um, in cars and in bikes, and some of the work that I've done has been on biosensing on motorbikes to increase the safety of our riders on the roads. So this kind of stuff, although it has some sort of like weird applications, it does have some quite sensible applications as well. So what we've done is monitor the passenger on the back of a bike to see how stressed they are, to set off a, a, an alert um, to the rider when the passenger is stressed, so if they're going around two corners too fast. Because communication between rider and passenger is really poor um, because of the helmets, this, is, this was deemed a really useful system. And we also synchronised it with Google Maps to give riders indication of which roads are safe and which roads cause the most passenger stress. And we've got some plans at the minute to incorporate this into the actual motorbike hardware. Because what we've done is we've tested this on a motorbike simulator that we have that some computer scientists developed for us. So those are quite outlandish projects, but something a bit more sedate is we're also working on getting sailboats to sail themselves. One of the applications I'm interested in is oceanographic monitoring, so monitoring of how many fish are left in the sea. And what, we, what we're trying to do is develop a fleet of small robotic boats which can sail themselves and cover large amounts of, of water at any one point in time. And what we're doing at the minute 
is writing all the computer programs to control the behavior of the boat so it can sail itself. So this is combining con something called control engineering with computer science and applying it to a problem that, um, that is really noisy and messy in real world. So we think that this can have applications in ocean monitoring, so not only water quality, but things like detection of pirates um, off the coasts of Africa, and also for the detection of any sort of pollution in water systems. And this uses the same kind of stuff that your mom's washing machine uses. This is another application of fuzzy logic. So the, and the fuzziness tells the boat which way to go. So that's the sales pitch over. I just thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about what it's been like to actually be a girl and do this stuff, because it is different to being a boy and doing this stuff. For many years, I didn't want there to be any differences, and I didn't acknowledge they exist. But they do, and there's some things that you can do to help yourself. It, it, it's, it's a fact of life. It's a fact that I've come to accept that computer science is made up mostly of boys and they sometimes don't know how to take a shower and it gets a bit disgusting, especially when they have deadlines. It's a bit strange because you think of compute, computer science as being kind of similar to maths, maybe similar to physics, but there's quite an even split in those subjects in comparison to the 8% women we have in computer science. So, and this subject really needs the women and I girls, as I call them, to keep the boys in check to facilitate better communication skills for teamwork, to think more creatively about how we can design and develop for these emerging technologies. And it's a different way of working which can add a strength to an organisation. And also to make sure that they do find a shower every now and again. But it can be really intimidating as you feel sometimes you have to be better than the boys at everything. But this is kind of changing, and this is continuing to change. When I first started out, I had to be really, really competitive to make an impression. And there was a bias against me. But um, society's working to overcome this, and certainly universities are working to overcome this. So, thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you.